Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places to those, belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here ends the reading of our Holy Scripture. So in our scripture for today, we find Jesus interacting with his disciples. Specifically in the beginning, it's just John and James. And they come to Jesus and they ask if, he can, if they can sit at his left and right hand when they all reach glory. Jesus asked them, essentially, can you follow what I have taught you? And the answer, well, of course we can. Jesus we can follow that, but now, about those seats. See, I like mine a bit more firm, and John likes his a bit more soft. And so left or right, you decide, but make sure you get those cushions right. Well, Jesus tells them, good, you will drink from the cup I drink and be baptized as I am, but I am not the one that decides who sits on my right and left. The ones that will sit in those places have already been decided, and it has been prepared for them. And then word gets back to the other ten disciples about what James and John have been talking to Jesus about. And they are not happy. And they begin to quarrel with one another. Now why do you think they were fighting with each other? Did the other ten look at James and John and say, Hey, you can't ask Jesus a question like that. What is wrong with you? You can't go out asking if you can be the number two and number three guys. That's not okay. Or were they mad because they didn't think to ask Jesus first? I think the answer is probably more to do with that. They were mad because James and John got the drop on them and asking Jesus if they could be on the left and right. And I believe that because of the response that Jesus gives to all of them. You know that the ones that are over the Gentiles, the leaders, they lord it over their people. But if you want to be great, you must be a servant. Look to me. I didn't come to be served, but to serve others and to sacrifice my life for many. And as I pondered the scripture this week, the idea of questions came into my mind. Specifically, what kind of questions are we asking God whenever we pray to him? Because you see, this scripture really does start with a question. Jesus, can we be the ones that sit on your right and left? Now, this question that was asked was not done out of a spirit of servanthood. Jesus makes that very clear. It was not asked because they wanted to be right there with Jesus, serving others with him. It was asked because James and John were seeking power and position over others. But when I thought about that question that James and John ask, it is not unlike how we tend to talk to God as well whenever we are praying and asking God questions. Because when we pray, a lot of what we are doing is simply asking God questions. 
But we ask him things like this, where they ask to sit at the right and left. We ask things like, hey, God, can you give me some more money? God, can you make sure that I get that promotion? Can you please help me get that new car, Lord? And as I said today in the children's sermon, my first question would be, why mosquitoes? Not that I spend a lot of time actually praying that to God, but it is a question I have. But you see, sometimes we get this idea that when we're praying, that our prayers are simply wishes. And indeed, there is a school of theology that is very popular today where preachers put that idea out for people. You see, they tell those people, all you simply need to do is name what it is that you want and then call it out to God and then believe in it and he's going to grant it to you. Because God wants you to get everything that you want. Oh, and don't forget to put it on your social media accounts as well so everyone can see what it is that you want. Oh, and if you happen to somehow get the thing that you wanted, remember to give me that preacher praise for teaching you the way to pray to God so that you get exactly the things that you want. You see, these people like to quote Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. But specifically, they like to cite the very beginning of Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. But you see, the problem with any verse of the Bible is when you take it out of greater context, you can then bend it to mean exactly what it is that you want it to mean. See, the very next part after that, ask and it will be given to you is, seek and you will find. And Jesus is talking about seeking the kingdom of God. And he tells us that we are always to be seeking our place in servanthood in that kingdom. Indeed, in James chapter 4, 3, Jesus says this, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. You ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. He tells them this right after saying how we as people allow our passions to cloud how we should be acting. And I think the main issue that we should take with the teachings of this manner is this idea that calling upon God to fulfill your every dream, that is simply reducing God to being some sort of magic genie. You rub the lamp and God will grant you your three wishes. No, brothers and sisters, that is not the purpose of prayer. God is not some ma magic genie. God is so much more than that. So when we pray, we are asking our questions of him. And we're bringing God our praise as well. And our needs and our concerns. Those are the things that we are to lift up to the Lord. But sometimes when we pray, we also find this. You see, we ask God a question, and through our prayers, the answer is no. And if it's something that we really want, and even though we've gotten that answer of no, we say, are you sure, God? Are you sure you don't want me to have all that money? I should probably pray again just to make sure you heard me. It's not unlike what a child will do with a parent. See, when one of our kids, and I'm not going to name them today, even though they're not with us this morning, was around three years old, we were eating at the local Mexican restaurant. And now you may or may not know, I really love spicy food. And I was putting habanero sauce onto my tortilla chips and, and eating them. And the child asked me, hey dad, can I have some of that? And I told them, no. But dad, I want some. No, it is too spicy for you, and you won't like it. I want it, 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 I want it. Finally, and what I have to admit is a moment of not really great parenting on my part. I gave in to them. I put a tiny drop on a chip and gave it to them. And oh, how their face lit up when they realized the mistake that they had made. It went from I want it to, Dad, I need a drink now. But you see, God is a good father. 
and we can come to him with anything, but sometimes the answer is no. And when the answer is no, we need to accept that it is no and then move forward. We don't want to be like that child asking over and over and over again. We have to learn to, what we have to learn to do is to trust when the answer is no. Because that means that God is saying no because he wants to protect us. Finally, I'll leave you with this thought today. When Jesus told the disciples that they were wrong and how they were approaching the kingdom of God, he reminded them that if they wanted to be great, then they must be servants. But what does that look like for us when we put it through this lens of prayer that we're discussing this morning? Have you ever stopped in the midst of all your prayers and asked God to use you as a servant? And what would it look like for us if we began to shift the focus of our prayers from this idea of, God, I want this, to, God, I want to be your servant? You see, that is a whole different way of thinking. Now, I know that when we pray, we usually focus more on others than ourselves. At least I hope that is the way that we are praying. Lord, help so-and-so. They are having a hard time. Lord, please be with them. They are facing this terrible thing in their lives. Now, do not misunderstand me, church. That is a good and wonderful thing. And we should be praying for one another, those inside this church and those that are outside of this church as well. We should be lifting them up. But I would challenge you to pray for yourself as well. Not to pray that you are granted great wealth or that you're lifted up above others, but to pray for the strength to serve the Lord. God, please use me as your vessel. Lord, help me to see where I can be best of service to you. Father, help me find ways that I can share your love with others. Give me those opportunities, God. God, please bring those that need help to me so that I can help them and act in your love. You see, those questions and those thoughts, when we bring them to God, he is going to love to hear that. And when we are praying for others, I encourage you to lift them up in the same way. Lord, I can see the way that you're working in that person's life. Father, help them to see it as well. Lord, I can see the ways that you are calling them to serve. Help them to be brave and to follow you. You see, these are great ways that we can pray for one another as well. And they are all questions that when we bring them to God, I have no doubt that he will be happy to hear them. Recently, I had the opportunity to go to an all-day retreat as part of the conference. And I say opportunity, but it, it was required. <laughs> that I'd be there, but I was happy to be there. And our key speaker was J.R. Briggs, and uh, J.R. Briggs is um, a pastor in Philadelphia, and then also he is a coach of pastors. That is what he does uh, for a living. And one of the things that he said during this meeting that really stuck with me is, he is done praying safe prayers. Have you ever thought about that? What is a safe prayer? A safe prayer is a prayer that you know the answer to before you even ask God. God, please be with me. God is always with you. God, please watch over me. God is always watching over you. So he has said he is done praying those safe prayers. Instead, he is asking more questions like this. God, show me how I can serve you. God, give me the heart to go where I need to go without question. See, those are not safe prayers. Because when you pray those things and God shows you where you should go, you have asked for it. And God knows you've asked for it. And now it is up to you to follow through. And so I want you to think about those thoughts in your prayers as well. So as you pray this week, my challenge for you is this. I want you to ask God to help you see where you can be a servant in his kingdom. And I challenge you 
to ask him to bring people into your lives that you can serve in his name. Amen.